It's going to be a little bit makeshift because I don't have the right uh, connectors to the projector down here, so we had to run it up there. So I'm going to try to be communicating with the young man up there to advance the slides. So hopefully this uh, will not uh, get too chaotic. But thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Green. I'm the state representative for District 57. I see a lot of familiar faces out in the crowd uh, and some new ones. And this is a great turnout. And, and I'm very uh, appreciative that we have such a good turnout. I wanted to meet with the, uh, the, the citizens of the district before the legislative session gets started on the 26th, the week from next Monday, because I've been getting a lot of emails. I've communicated with many of you that are here uh, in, uh, uh, on some important issues. And so I want to go over those issues and, and then open it up for questions about issues I may, or topics I may not have covered. But in all of the emails that I've received, there, there are four predominant themes or, or issues. I don't know if that light's going to continue to do that or not. Um, and those four are uh, gasoline tax, transportation funding. Uh, the second one is the relocation of the prison, which doesn't necessarily affect our district, other than financially, as, as part of the state, as taxpayers. And most of the emails and other messages that I've been getting have been from citizens outside the district. But I wanted to touch on that anyhow, um, but we'll, we'll do that one quickly. The, uh, the third thing, which does affect our district, and I have received a lot of communication from our district residents, is the, wood, the proposed wood burning ban. And uh, I, I guess I am a little surprised with the, the amount of backlash from that. Uh, out of curiosity, did anybody go to the first public meeting on that uh, with the Division of Air Quality last night? It was in Tooele, so you probably didn't go. But, uh, but they're having six of those around the state. The first one was last night. And I hear it was about as one-sided as the county commission meeting Tuesday here in Utah County. Uh, you, you guys are doing great things, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to have so many of you active in, in the political issues that affect not only our cities, our neighborhoods, and our district, but our state as a whole. And then the, the fourth thing was just general tax increases. The media has been overplaying the desire or the appetite of your legislature to raise taxes. And I've, I've seen the reports, and I've heard from many of you, and, and many of these news reports just kind of report this as a foregone conclusion, that the legislature is going to raise your taxes, whether it's your sales tax or your gas tax or other taxes to fund various different things. And so we'll talk a lot about the budget. Uh, and, and so let's, uh, let's start off with that topic. Go ahead and advance the slide. Yeah, we're not going to be able to see that. Uh, but basically what this is here is a list of uh, factors in our federal, or in our national economy, and even some international issues that have an impact on our national economy and therefore our state economy. Uh oh, there we go. Okay. So we've had some recovery in the U.S. in the in the United States, but it hasn't accelerated. It's been very slow throughout this recovery. Our GDP has been low. Our job growth. Uh, I heard it, since this slide was put together. I just heard a report. Um, where did that come from? Um, I was just this week that although we are adding jobs, our average income or average salary per job is, is still going down. And so that's not, that's, that's not all good news. But all of these factors here, including the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, as we implement that further, and the geopolitical threats, all have an impact on the U.S. economy and therefore Utah's economy. So these are issues that we have to 
deal with, try to anticipate and forecast as we go through the budget making process. We're not all a bunch of bumbling idiots in the legislature. In fact, I, I wouldn't say any of us are. Uh, we get that reputation sometimes, but uh, we, we are very conscientious in this pro uh, uh, process, even though we have a very condensed period of time with which to complete it. So go ahead and, and uh, advance to the next slide, up, if you would. Oh, this, you can't read that, but uh, this is a, a little cartoon that kind of describes what we don't do uh, with respect to the budget. It, it would be convenient to be able to push all of these issues down the road and not consider them as we try to put together a budget. And this is a, the founders around the Declaration of Independence, and it says, I realize that you guys, it's a guy here on the left speaking, I realize that you guys are all caught up in the moment, but some of us think it would be safer to kick the can down the road. And uh, thank goodness they didn't do that. And, and we try to, as your legislature, have that same stewardship and that same responsibility to address these critical issues that are before us and not kick them down the road. Uh, and, and that oftentimes creates some conflict and some contention between the legislature and the executive branch, the governor. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of that is healthy. But I say that because the governor is a full-time governor. And he's got the bully pulpit and he's got the news media in front of him whenever he wants it. And so about November of every year, he starts talking about the things he wants to see and the, and the direction he wants the state to go and releases those pieces of information as if they're policy and, and that's what we're going to do. And you may have, I mean, that, that's where the wood burning ban uh, proposal came from. Uh, now, we do have air quality issues. I don't dispute that. I don't, I, and, and we do take steps every year as a legislature to try to handle that. But the, the type of absolute uh, blanket ban that has been proposed doesn't seem to have a whole lot of support. Uh, and, and, and there's a whole lot of people that have been impacted by it. So uh, the next thing he talked about, the governor talked about, it, as he released his proposed budget in December was a $600 million surplus that was going to go to education. And that would be nice. Uh, we, would, we would love to be able to better fund education. Uh, but we have demographic challenges in this state that are unique and that are <coughs> so far removed from what any other state uh, it has to face. The national average of, of student or public school age population to working adult age population is 25 public age or public education age students for every 100 working age adults. And that gives you some indication of your base, uh, your, your revenue base to fund public education. In Utah, we are 50% higher than that. We have 37 school-aged children to every 100 working-age adults. So we are always going to struggle. I mean, that's not just a slight difference from the national average. That's a dramatic difference. And those, that's a challenge that we put on ourselves knowingly, for good reason. Uh, that, that has a lot to do with our culture here. But, but understanding that, we then have to deal with what those challenges mean in, in funding education. and so. If we, it would be nice to give $600 million of, of new money to education, but it just can't be done, and I'll show you why. So go ahead and advance uh, again. Oh, one thing we need to understand is the, the, these two terms, one-time versus ongoing revenue. Go ahead and, and advance. Uh, one-time comes from prior year surpluses, which we have some of this year. Changes to the current year estimate, as we go through the current year estimate, that can either go up or down from, from the uh, beginning of the year estimate. So that would be one-time money. And then other sources like lawsuits and things like that. One-time money, by policy, that the legislature I think has prudently adopted, can only be spent for one-time 
expenditures. We can't use one-time money for ongoing expenditures, expenditures we will have every year, which would be funding of education. Much of this money, this surplus that we have, $600 million, is one-time money. And the last thing we want to do is say to teachers, we're going to give you a 5% raise, and then next year not be able to fund it because the one-time money is gone. So we have to do those types of things with, uh, with ongoing revenue. So click again, and, and that is just regular continuous revenue sources. And so there's a lot that goes into this budgetary process. Again, advance. So let's talk about where it comes from, uh, advance. This was our current year budget of $13.5 billion. The budget we will be preparing when we convene in two weeks will be uh, about $14 billion because we have about $600 million of new money. Uh, and I'm assuming we're going to spend it all. Uh, and, and so these are the areas where it comes from education fund. Uh, that is, uh, that's, that's income tax. Income tax is constitutionally dedicated to education. And we have general fund money, it comes from different sources, federal money, uh, and, and some other things. But the two big ones um, that we're going to deal with are federal, uh, or excuse me, general fund and education fund. Go ahead and go forward, advance. Oh, okay, so those two combined are about $5.8 billion. Notice federal funds are 27%, which is actually down a little bit from where we peaked out uh, with our reliance on federal funds. <coughs> I see that as a, a positive uh, trend, and hopefully we can keep going in that direction. Uh, advance. So go ahead, keep going. Listen. Okay, so go ahead and advance till that fills up one more time. Okay. So we have dedicated revenue buckets. Our income tax, corporate income tax, uh, as sheets, you don't need to worry about that, but that's essentially when people die without uh, their estate going, it has no place to go, then it, it comes to the state. That's, that's a small amount. That goes into our education budget. Our general sales tax, sin taxes, alcohol and tobacco and that, and uh, severance, the, the money that the state gets when from, from the mineral leases that it grants for oil and gas and coal and other things that those, as those natural resources come out of the ground, the state gets a significant portion of that. And so that all goes into the general fund. The transportation fund is your motor fuel tax, your special fuel tax, which is like uh, aviation tax, uh, aviation fuel and some other things, and your vehicle registration fee, those go in, that goes into the transportation fund. Now, the surplus we're talking about, 600 million roughly of new money, is spread across those categories. So it can't all go into education. Uh, that, that's the first point I want to make. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. <coughs> uh, go ahead, we don't need to waste time on that, but keep going until the new slide comes up. So where it goes. So out of that 13.5 billion, 30% goes to public education. Now, you've heard, I'm sure, the comment, which is true, it's, it's not a comment, it's a fact, that Utah's per pupil funding for public education is dead last of all 50 states. And that's true. But that's just one metric. If you look at the percent of our state budget, we're in the top 25% on education funding. Again, that's due to the challenges we have with the much higher ratio of, of school age children to adults. So I always like to make sure that people understand that when they complain about us being 50th out of 50 states in per pupil funding, we're in the top 25% of states in the percent of our whole budget that is spent on, on public education. 12% to higher education. Here's the big one, though, that is really problem for us and is, is going to continue to grow is social services. Currently we're at 34%. It's the single biggest expenditure we have. And the biggest expenditure in that is Medicaid. And so with the, uh, the governor's 
Healthy Utah proposal, which is Medicaid expansion under Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, uh, we're going to see that number go up significantly. Not initially, uh, there will be a small increase initially, but uh, when the, the federal government decides it no longer wants to fund 100% of the expansion, uh, we're faced with the proposition of discontinuing the program to the detriment of our citizens who have become reliant on it, or paying for it ourselves. Um, go ahead and advance. Okay, so, and, and this is just the general uh, education, the, the general fund and the education fund, which was the, the two components I said that we were gonna focus most on. And, and that's just a breakdown of those two, 48% goes to public education. You can see social, social services is a little, it's half of what it was under the general uh, the whole budget because a lot of those funds are federal funds. And they don't come from our general fund or our education fund. All right, go ahead and advance. So let's talk about where we are currently. Advance. And this is the, the uh, 5.6. Uh, and, and believe it or not, when we convene in two weeks, we will be talking about and, and creating the fiscal year 2016 budget. We're in the 2015 right now, we're halfway through it. Our fiscal year goes from July 1st through June 30th. And so we start the, the 2016 fiscal year budget halfway through 2015. So that's the one we will be working on. And you can see, we can, just in the general and education fund, we're up about 200 million uh, there. Okay, go ahead, go forward. So here's where we get into the, get into the weeds with the governor. And why, as much as we would love to be perceived as the most education friendly legislature in the country, uh, we're often not because we have to make the hard choices. We've got um, uh, ongoing, fund, uh, ongoing money. We've got 77 in the general fund, 248 in the education fund. One time is 93 out of the general fund, uh, 220, 220 million uh, in the education fund for a total of uh, 638. Okay, advance. Go ahead, advance again. But here's the problem. This $638 million of surplus is a double-edged sword. It's, it's great because we have more money that we can fund necessary services with, or we could put money in a rainy day fund, build that back up. I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. Um, or we could talk about a tax break, but with all of the talk this year about tax increases, I don't think anyone, uh, I don't think there's, there's, I don't think there's an appetite for a tax increase, but I also don't think we're gonna see a tax decrease. So let me just leave it at that. But this, uh, this is the way we look at these uh, revenue sources. You plot them out over the year, and, and this is just an example. Uh, it's a corporate tax collection, but. But you do this with every source of revenue. And you can see as you go across the years uh, on the bottom, that line of actual revenue kind of jumps all over the place. That dotted line that has the gradual uh, increase is the trend line. What that, uh, that hash area above the trend line we call bubble revenue. We refer to that as bubble revenue because it's above the trend line. We don't want to become reliant on it because the trend says it, <coughs> you, that that's a short period we're going to, to have that level of revenue. And it's, it'll fluctuate, but we can't rely on it for ongoing money. We, so we rely on what is within the trend line. So go ahead and click the next slide. This is the... Um, is that as blurry to the rest of you as it is to me? My eyes just must be bad. Uh, 
So, so here we have the general fund and the education fund revenue sources. And the, the blue line is the trend. And that, you, you can't really distinguish the colors here, but that you can see that the more squiggly line, the gray line, is um, the actual. So we have periods where the actual is significantly above the trend line. And that's where we are right now with some of this revenue. So go ahead and click the, the next one. So what we do is we take, you can see the second line up there, bubble revenue in the general fund. 58 million of the 77 is above the trend line. So instead of relying on that and then not having it next year or the year after, we bring that ongoing revenue down to the trend line and shift the bubble revenue over to one time. We treat it as one time and just use it for that next budget so we don't become reliant on it. And then if you go down to education, you can see the same thing. 58 million was above the trend line, so we moved that to one-time money. So now all of a sudden, we have uh, 189, excuse me, we have 179 million of ongoing money, 429 of one-time money. Click uh, forward. Now that's significant, go again, because of the 179 available ongoing for education, just to fund growth of new students at our current rate, that takes 52 of the million, or 52 million of that money. To give a 1% increase in the WPU, the weighted pupil unit, that's our basic formula for funding education, and I won't get into that because it's so confusing I don't fully understand it. But just a 1% increase, which would reflect in a 1% increase across the board in wages. So raises to student uh, to teachers. That's 26 million. Um, medical uh, Medicaid inflation uh, and capital improvements. There, there are some other things here. All of a sudden now we're down, and we spend it all. Uh, health insurance is a big one. We're seeing that type of increase every year, just to fund our teachers' health insurance and administrators as well. Every all the employees within. And another one uh, that isn't even on there is retirement. That goes up dramatically every year. And, uh, and so 179 million is gone. Go ahead and click forward. Uh, so the available one-time money, we had 429. Uh, we've got buildings for capital improvements. We have a building board that uh, board meeting a committee uh, that determines the, the most important capital improvement projects that the state has and prioritizes them. And that list is at 510 million, just, just the priority stuff. Uh, so if we used it all for that, we, you know, we wouldn't even have enough. Uh, and then here's some other things that uh, we have long-term capital improvement needs. And the prison, you can see, is on there. Now, let's talk about the prison right now, because I said I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it's important to understand. A lot of the emails I get talk about it's a waste of taxpayers' money to move the prison. And I can assure you, I have studied these numbers carefully. It's not, that, that's not the argument. That, that argument is flawed. It's not a waste of money to do that. There may be other good reasons for not moving it, but uh, it, inefficient use of taxpayer money is not a valid reason. Because regardless of whether we move it or not, we have 500 to 800 million in maintenance. A lot of it deferred maintenance that we haven't been doing. And it, it's, it's reaching a critical mass right now. It's, it's reaching uh, a crisis. It, Part of that, not, not the whole 800 million. And so that the only way we have to fund that uh, to re, uh, revitalize the current prison, if it stays in Draper, is taxpayer revenue. So we're going to spend 500 to 800 million over the next 10 years on the Draper prison. It is estimated, I, I don't even want to say estimated because that, that's too 
weep of a word. Studies, very thorough and careful studies, have shown that for about a billion dollars, we can move the prison, rebuild it, but we will recover the vast majority of that million, a billion dollars from the sale of the land that the prison is on now. So, you know, we'll still be into it a little bit. It won't cover the entire move, but it won't, the, the difference is going to be much less than the five to eight hundred million. You don't agree with me? No. Okay, well let's talk about it. That's why we're here. Why not? People have been saying that the, the cost of the prison to build it right now, they say in a short time, and maybe, maybe that's true, but they're talking about 10, 15 years, it'll be shorter term to tear, build a new prison, really demolish it, use the land around there, and maybe in 20 or 30 years, maybe the cost difference would be in the tax base. But look what, I mean, the, the, where it's located right now, it's got all the essential elements. Right next to the freeway, it's close to hospitals. All the infrastructure is already there. You're right. And you move it out into who knows where, those costs are going to go up, and it's going to be a whole lot more than what they're, what they're trying to tell us right now. Well, I, I don't want to turn this into an argument, but I've seen the studies and the projected cost for extending certain services. Now, if you go way out in a salt flat, certainly, but if you go out past uh, Tooele, or out near Tooele, Grantsville, for instance, um, to extend the tracks line there isn't going to, I mean, it, that's one of the proposals that they've looked at. But, but this is the point that I was getting at. Uh, those are all good arguments for keeping it where it is. The services are there. Uh, we have easy access. All of that's still there. That's a valid argument that I can accept. I don't have any skin in this game, and I did, I'm assuming many of you don't either, because we don't, it's not going to be in our backyard no matter where it goes. And so I'm just trying to make the point that the cost and the waste of taxpayer dollars is not a valid argument. Some of the things you brought up certainly are, but, uh, but those are other arguments. And, and they may be justification enough for leaving it where it is. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not sold either way. So I'd like to know what, uh, what all of you think. But wouldn't also, I mean, not only the sale of the land, but the ongoing sales tax revenue and business that comes in there, plus the uh, cost of the land itself, and the right. desire of people to locate in that area would go way up instead of being located next to Person. And so business-wise, it would seem like it would make more sense, especially since Lehigh and that whole area of Sandy is all growing Silicon Valley-wise. It would be great to move that out there. You can get the sale of you get the revenue of the land, plus the sales tax, plus the more corporate businesses that would move into the area. Sure. And that would seem like that would be a good thing. Plus, if we're going to sink by about $800 million just to keep it running the way it is, you know, why not move it into a better place and get a better facility? That's going to last us another 100 years or whatever, the 75 years, instead of trying to keep this going, and then 10 years from now, we're going to have to do more people's And I'm glad you made that point. This does need to be a 75 to 100 year decision. Yeah. And, and so all those factors need to be taken into consideration. Like I said, I wanted to keep this discussion short just because it's not in our district. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that your contribution as taxpayers isn't uh, necessarily negatively impacted by moving it or keeping it there. I mean, you, you could make the argument that you're going to end up paying more if you keep it there, but the argument I've been hearing most commonly is that let's spend the money somewhere else. We have greater needs than a new prison. Well, we have to spend the money regardless. So there was one more question. Ed, go ahead. I got the sense of the five hundred eight hundred million. Part of that was because of the burden of the Yes, the prison is is quite old. Sure, how old? Well, thirty years old. When I served my mission, different parts of it. Uh, there are there are parts of it that are uh, fifty years old or more, and then we've we've continued to expand it. But uh, so, so if that's the case, if they've got to curb things, that means that they haven't been able to budget in some way to keep up with what's going on. Is that a legislative issue? That's a legislative decision because okay, because this prison relocation discussion has been ongoing for six to eight years. 
And so why build a new building? There's been reluctance to it. put money into it if it was looking like we were going to move it. It was only this year, the in fact, in fact, the past six months, really, where this groundswell of public opposition has erupted. Similar to BRT down in Provo, Orem. That's been ongoing in the works for a long time, but it's only been in the last several months that we've seen this groundswell of opposition. And it's a good thing. I'm not criticizing that at all. Uh, it's important for you as citizens to, to speak up. And there's no such thing as too late to the game, but it is better to, to get in and, and express your voice early. So, so I guess I have a question there. I'm not sure that's why I asked the question is if they move to prison, are they working under a model that is somehow deficient in meeting the financial needs of the prison? Is that going to be looked at as part of that? Yeah, one of the other things I wanted to touch briefly on was uh, we are experiencing, we are one of the only states that is experiencing a continued increase in our population, our prison population. We had a prison population explosion nationwide um, from about nine, 1990, uh, mid to late 80s, uh, at about a, for about a 20 year period. And many states began to look at those problems because they were overcrowded in their, in their prisons and they were spending whole lot of money. You know, we spend about uh, $36,000 a year per, at the state level, per inmate, as opposed to about $6,500, $7,000 a year per public education student. So th that's one area right there we need to take a better look at and, uh, and find efficiency. So at the same time we're talking about this prison relocation, the state has engaged in a very comprehensive study of a criminal justice system reform. And you'll see some bills come through the legislature uh, that will address those things. Uh, because the, the bulk of our population increase is from recidivism. Not people, once they get out, committing a new crime, but violating a condition of their release, whether it's payment of a fine, uh, probation, parole conditions that aren't in and of themselves criminal, but because of the situation they're in, it lands them back in inside. And, and so we have done this study, and it has, uh, we, we have a full report now that's out, and you can find that online. It's the, uh, it was put out by the, um, oh, I'm trying to, the, the the acronym for the agency is CCJJ, and I'm trying to remember. It's the Criminal Something and Juvenile Justice uh, Division of, of the Executive Branch. And we've got this very comprehensive study now that has a bunch of proposals that if we adopt these proposals, the projections are that instead of our population continuing to increase, oh, and that's the other thing I forgot to mention, if we don't make changes, our current prison population will go up 50% over the next 10 years. If we do make these changes, it'll essentially level off, plateau, and stay the same. Uh, and so the need for uh, continued uh, increased capacity within our prisons is will be moderated. Now, we do have a newer prison down in Gunnison, and there's a whole lot of new ideas, philosophies, and structures that have come into place with you know, how to make an efficient prison setting. We've done a lot of that in Gunnison, uh, and we would certainly do that with a new prison, which would have a lot of built-in efficiencies that we won't get if we just continue to dump money into the one we have. I shouldn't have said dump money because that makes it sound like I'm passing judgment on it. I don't mean that, but this is really an issue that I don't know where I'm at on yet. Uh, I, I've seen both sides, and I've seen the outpouring of, of concern from citizens, which to me is, is one of the most significant factors. So we'll see where this goes, but it's, it's beginning to look like we're not going to be moving the prison because we don't have any place to put it now. Every place that has been identified 
for the most part, they, the, the cities uh, have taken it off the table because of the reaction from citizens. So we'll see where it goes. It's not a done deal yet. The decision, final decision, hasn't been made. But let's move on from the prison, okay? Uh, well, Brian, just one, one last thought sure. on, on the study. <clears throat> I haven't looked at it in real detail, but the, uh, what, what it, they seem to be proposing is they seem to be saying let's, uh, because a lot of these problem, a lot of these inmates are drug related crimes, they're not really dealing, they're just users. Let's take money and, um, uh, and instead of putting these people in jail, let's put them into treatment. That, that's one of the proposals. I have, uh, just me personally, I have a real concern with that because once again, we're going down this path of let's just grow government. Instead of penalizing a problem, we're now going to pay for a rehab. And, and, and I'm, but, I'm, but we're not growing I'm, government. The proposal isn't for new money. No, it's, it's not new money. It's just for using the, the current well, money. Well, that was my concern, though, because aren't we once again creating a dependency on government that will grow? That was my concern. They don't seem to think that's the case, yeah. but we, my, my limited experience is once you're giving free things out to people, you, you're, you know... Well, we, we wouldn't give out free things. I mean, be people that had committed crimes, committed violations, but are then diagnosed as mentally deficient. We have a large percentage of our population, our prison population, that is, uh, that suffers from mental illness. And we treat them through the criminal justice system, which right. is inefficient and ineffective, because with those mental deficiencies, the traditional uh, uh, deterrent uh, punishment and reformation ideas of the criminal justice system just don't work on people, right. on many people that are mentally deficient. I, I would so agree we're spending that. the money on them anyhow, but we're not getting any benefit for it. I would so. agree with you on that, but my, my comment was limited to drug users. Uh, in, instead of criminal, criminalizing it, we'll make it a, uh, a, a treatment problem, and the government will start spending on yeah. treating drug, drug abuse. Well, we're not talking about decriminalizing drug uh, drug use, drug possession, drug transactions. Right. We are talking about taking uh, some of those that are felonies now to a Class A misdemeanor. Uh, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that um, that we just don't have time to, to get into. But, but the savings to the state uh, are noticeable, are, are very measurable. And if you, if you assume that that population is not going to grow. Yes. Yeah. And, Drugs are a terrible thing. Right? Yeah. They're very addictive, and, so, and, and, I'm just saying, and they continue. If I want to get on the dole, an easy way is just to start doing drugs now. I don't think anybody yeah. looked at that, and maybe that's a... And, and, and I really don't think like there are thing. many people that consciously make that decision. You know, I'm going to become a drug addict, so the government will take care of me. There may be some, but I just... To me, that that's almost that almost defies logic, that, that people would make that conscious decision. That may be the net result uh, that... They become stewards of the state because of choices they've made. But, uh, yeah. So, so watch those. If you're interested in that, you can find that report online uh, on the state's website. Uh, and, and offline, you know, you're, I, I welcome any questions on that. So, so this is a snapshot of our general rainy day fund. And you can see how up through 2000, what is that, 8 or 9, 2008, it, it hit its peak. And of course, that co coincides with the beginning of the recession. And then we dipped into that a lot so that we didn't have to cut things way back in the state. There was a lot of cut. There were a lot of cuts in the state budget during the recession, but not as many as other states had to uh, turn to because we dipped into that general rainy day fund and our education rainy day fund as well, which has a similar uh, graphic. But we haven't been building that back up. That, that red line is where we should be. That's the trend we should be on. And we just haven't, as, as our revenue has been increasing, we haven't been putting money back in there. And with this $638 billion, a million dollar surplus, we're not talking about putting any of that in there. Well, you know, I, I want to point out that in a $13 billion budget, the rainy day fund that we're talking about is what, 200 million at the peak? I mean, we're talking a few percent. Right. Just so people understand that, they, you know, it's not like we got a half a year in there, we got a couple of months. Right. And, um, and that's why we had to resort to, to some serious cuts as well. But, well, I'm, but I'm, this helped 
take the edge off. Yeah, I would have done the same thing, you know. And uh, so we're, we're, I think it's important to get it back to where it should be, not yeah. only where it should be, but even beyond that. Um, now, there are a lot of ways we can do that. One of those involves uh, you know, having control over the 66% of our land that we don't have control over, uh, and that is always going to be a priority of your legislature. Uh, so go ahead and advance that. I want to try to get moving through this. <coughs> oh, so we're at the end of that one. That, I have another one. <laughs> so go ahead and, and move that next one. one down in the bottom left. You with me? Okay. Well, it, well yeah. I was doing that right, but, but um, it, uh, back to the the uh, funding of the school system. It seems like we really should be phrasing the issue in around uh, getting the federal government. And I know this is an old argument and everything, but. I would like to hear our legislators talk about, you know, the real problem here is that we can't get the federal, we haven't been able yet to get the federal government to abide its contract and give us back our lands uh, so that we can get the, the revenue from, from those. You haven't heard me say that? I, not today. Did you say anything today? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's something I usually say every time I, I have a meeting. Um, you know, so much so that I, I, I kind of maybe develop somewhat of a complex, so I maybe... <laughs> Don't hit it as hard as I used to, but uh, because I know everyone's not on board with that. Uh, but and so I didn't even bring, I didn't even put that in my slides. But you have to look at the ownership of land, the control of land from the Rocky Mountains East versus the Rocky Mountains West, and, and you just can't look at that and not intuitively know that there's a great injustice there. Now, we are expected to do the same things that every other state does with respect to services for our, our citizens. And the biggest resource that enables us to do that is controlled, 66% of it's controlled by the federal government. And we do not generate revenue from that. So that to me is, uh, you know, I, I've made this comment before. I mean, to me that is a equality issue. That's a civil rights issue that we are treated differently as citizens of Utah than citizens of Kentucky are treated, or citizens of Minnesota, or any other state east of east of the uh, Rocky Mountains. So, and, 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 uh, and this is kind of a kind of way out. Well, no, let me just say the comment. So, comment is, is the con Utah Constitution says that we're supposed to have free education. I haven't seen it yet. So technically, this Utah is in breach of the contract with me. I think I would argue you you can make that <laughs> argument. Uh, the only way it would be free is if the state was generating revenue to pay for it without taking it from you. Exactly. But all of those funds come from you, you and, and your neighbors and the companies you work for through income tax. And so that's not free. You're not paying for it at the point of service, except for some fees and extracurricular activities and things. But uh, yeah, that, that's a very valid point. We can't do that. And, and I believe that that was what was anticipated when we became a state, is that it wouldn't be paid for through taxing us. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be paid for through the state and its abundance re abundant resources being able to generate enough revenue to provide free education. That's, that's why it's in the Constitution. Was there one more comment? Yes, back there. Another thing that's worrisome to me is the amount of waste in our school system. I mean, you know, when I was getting schools around here, and I look at, you know, you, you go out and you look at the salaries of people who work there, do we really need three principals at a high school making over $100,000 a year? I don't think so. Um, yeah, it, it's a sensitive issue. I agree with everything you've just said. Let me give you one other statistic. Over the last 20 years, here in Utah, we have added two administrative personnel for every one teacher. Is that a, a good use of public education dollars? I don't know. If, what's that? That's why test scores plummet. Yeah, I, I think. I, I'm sure there is a correlation there. 
But, uh, and it's not only we're adding it at a rate of two to one, but the two administrators get paid a lot more than the one teacher. And, and so now we're having a tough time getting quality teachers because they're getting paid a lot more in Idaho, in, in Nevada, maybe not so much Idaho, but in Nevada, our two biggest competitors are Nevada and Wyoming. Yeah, and so it, it is a challenge, but I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of local control. And I think most of you are as well, and you don't want the legislator the legislature mandating all of these restrictions on state, or excuse me, uh, county government, city government, or schools, school districts. So those problems need to be solved in your school districts. Uh, we continue to appropriate money as we are constitutionally required to do, but I don't think you want the legislature being a super school board and we do enough of that. We do too much of that already. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it. It's because we hear from you. We're like the first point of contact for most citizens on these issues for a number of reasons. They don't know who their school board members are. They're not as visible. They don't know who their state school board member is. Um, and, and so we seem to be the most visible. And if they do know who they are, they've had in many instances, not good experiences trying to make change. And so I think so there are some good things happening, but maybe not fast enough. Um, but uh, anyhow, we could, we could get sidetracked on that discussion, and, and I wanted to move on to Medicaid. Is it okay if we move on to Medicaid expansion? Now, this is a big issue. The governor's really pushing this. He's been working hard uh, to try to negotiate a deal with the federal government. And he's invested so much time and energy into it and has essentially got nothing. Uh, I understand why he feels so married to it at this point, because he's put so much into it. But the concessions that we have get, that got as a state are really window dressing. What we're talking about with Healthy Utah, is what the governor has called his plan, is 95 plus percent Obamacare Medicaid expansion, maybe 98 um, percent, and, and it's costly. But before I get to that, let's talk about where we are in Medicaid right now. 15 years from you know, 15 years ago to today, it was 13 uh, percent of, of our general fund was spent on Medicaid. Now it's 23 uh, percent. We had five. 0.5% uh, of our population on it, now we have 8.9%. Uh, the, the total cost, you can see how it's gone up about 50% roughly in the last 15 years per, uh, per citizen, per, per participant. Now, we're going to have, and this is traditional Medicaid, this is the Medicaid we've had for years. Uh, go ahead and advance. We are going to have, there's a mandatory expansion part of, of Medicaid. Whether or not we elect the Medicaid expansion Healthy Utah route, uh, every state is experiencing a, uh, an automatic increase or an automatic expansion of, uh, due to a number of factors. One, it's the individual mandate. We have a lot of people right now in Utah, not so much over the last year, but, but prior to this, uh, prior to Obamacare, we've had a lot of people that qualified for Medicaid, traditional Medicaid, but just weren't on it for various reasons. Maybe there was a stigma that, that they wanted to stay away from. Maybe they had other coverage uh, that they were paying for, but Medicaid's free. So with the individual mandate and the burden, <coughs> the, the duty of the state to put everyone who qualifies for traditional Medicaid on Medicaid, the whole application process doesn't seem so much like going in with your hat in your hand asking for welfare, as it just is signing up for medical coverage. And so we're going to have an increase of a minimum of 7,000 due to that, uh, the people that already qualify. And then there, there are some changes that will add uh, another um, 17,900 of, of, of uh, 
children that will move from uh, you know, chip. move to Medicaid from chip. Uh, so that is an increase in of 15 million a year to the state without any election to expand. Okay, advance. So here's what we're talking about with the expansion. Uh, when Obamacare was written and passed, they just assumed uh, it would be upheld by the courts, and so there was a mandatory expansion of Medicaid. And that was the one part of the, the Supreme Court decision that went in the favor of the states. The Supreme Court said to, the, to Congress, no, you cannot force states to expand Medicaid, uh, expand the program. You can tweak with the, the, the original program, which is where we get that first mandatory expansion, but you cannot force them to expand full loan or lose everything. And so what happened with that is that it created a scenario where there's a, there's a group of people that don't qualify for anything unless we do Medicaid expansion because the premium subsidies that you can get off from the state exchanges start at 100% of poverty level. And I've got a slide here that shows what that is, but um, you know, roughly for a, a, a family of four, um, can you advance the, for a family of four, you're looking at uh, 32, oh, excuse me, 27,000, 24,000, roughly, just under 24,000. That's not a lot of income. So if you had, so if you're at 100% of poverty level or above, uh, you qualify for premium subsidies, that's tax credits. Um, and at 100% of poverty level, it's essentially 100% reimbursement. And that goes all the way up to 400% of poverty level. So for a family of four, roughly $100,000 before it phases out completely. Um, but here's the, here's the problem we call the donut hole. Uh, if you don't expand Medicaid, the premium subsidies don't kick in for people under 100% of poverty rate. Currently, Medicaid doesn't cover every, everyone under 100% of poverty level. It only covers the hardship cases or the most critical needs. So children, um, uh, disabled, uh, pregnant women, and elderly who don't qualify for Medicare. So we've got a, a population, go ahead and advance. Uh, we've got a population, if you look along at the top here, um, at 100% of poverty level, about 93,000 people that are in this hole. And if it, go, if it goes up to 138%, that number is significant, and I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. There's about 146,000 Utahns that are in this hole without uh, premium subsidies. Now, from 94,000 up to 146, that 50, those 53,000 people can qualify for premium subsidies off from the exchange. But the 93,000 can't. Go ahead and advance that. And so there are a number of, of things we can do to address this. And what the governor's plan does is it, it provides Medicaid to everyone up to 138%. And you, you have to ask why. If, if you can get nearly 100% premium subsidy at 100%, why are we going to put those people from 100% of poverty rate up to 138%? Why are we going to put them on Medicaid instead of just having them go into the exchange and get the premium subsidies? And there's a reason for that. Go ahead and click that a couple more times till we get one more, one more. Okay. Um, the governor's plan, Healthy Utah, is this bottom one. And the reason that it's extended to 138% of poverty is because in the negotiations, we tried to get it to 100% only. The federal government said, fine, if we give that to you, then we're only going to give you a 70% participation rate, what your current uh, Medicaid reimbursement rate is uh, for, for traditional Medicaid. If you want the full 100% for the first three years and then declining to 90% ongoing, you have to do Medicaid expansion up to 
So here we go again, make, making a decision that affects our uh, revenue and, and our budget based on chasing the federal dollar. So that plan goes up to 138% so we can get that extra 20% uh, participation from the federal government. But with the state of affairs of the federal government, can we really rely on that in, in perpetuity going forward? I think that's a risky bet to make. And so what we've got are a number of options. These are options that we saw last year in the House and in the Senate that would just use state money and cover up to either 10000 or 22000 or one all the way up to um, 100% of poverty level, the full 93,000, but that would cost $136, $136 million at full implementation to the state. And the help of Utah would only cost $78 million if, and this is the big if, if the federal reimbursement stays at 90%, and I don't see how it can. So these are, these are the decisions that we have to to deal with. Uh, so, so that's Medicaid expansion, and that's why many of us in the House and in the, in the legislature are pushing back on this Healthy Utah plan. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's an incentive. It, it's highly in, uh, front-end incentivized, and we need to look at the back end to make sure we're not getting ourselves into a, a mess that, we just, that will just kill our budget. So go ahead and uh, let's go through that. Uh, go forward again. Uh, go go again. Okay. So uh, yeah, we. I don't know if we want to talk about all this. But I, I want to try to move along a little quicker. So uh, this just shows the match rate for 24, 2014 to twenty sixteen. It would be a hundred percent in twenty twenty. And those dollar figures that were on that previous slide were twenty twenty figures when when this thing's supposed to stabilize. Uh, and, and it goes to 90 and, until and unless Congress changes it again. Um, one of the other things, one of the reasons I'm not real eager to expand Medicaid is because there's another Supreme Court decision that could blow this whole thing up again. And that is that these premium subsidies under the statute the specific language of the statute says they are available through state-created and state-run exchanges. Now remember, states pushed back on this, particularly after the first uh, Supreme Court decision, and half of them refused to create these exchanges. Remember the, the exchange, the federal exchange that uh, the, the government created? It was how many hundreds of millions of dollars, 600 or so million dollars to create that exchange. Well, the states, some of them did the same thing. Oregon created an exchange and they were into it tens of millions, uh, I think even hundreds of millions of dollars trying to do that. So many states didn't do it. And so the federal government just is offering or is providing those premium subsidies through the federal exchange. That is clearly, uh, uh, that clearly contradicts the letter of the law. Now, the government's, federal government's argument is that was just an oversight. We just meant, you know, an exchange, you know, if they were doing that within their state, and the federal government has put an exchange into each of the states that refused to create one. So we, we really didn't mean to make a distinction between state and federal, which is a lie. It's a, a bold-faced lie. This was the corn husker kickback. Remember when Senator Nelson in Nebraska was the, the key vote on this? It, this was the issue that he did not want there to be a mandate from the federal government that the state had to create an exchange. Because even though he was a Democrat, he was still states rights oriented because Nebraska is a very you know, conservative state, very independent state. And so he held out and they had to cut that deal with him. Said, okay, we will not have a mandate on the states to create an exchange the federal government will create it where the states refuse to. So they knew going in that, and they intentionally wrote it that way. So my, my thinking is the federal government's going to lose this case. And at that point, 
tens of millions of people who are now getting premium subsidies through the state exchanges, I mean through the federal exchange, aren't going to get it. So this whole thing is going to have to be reworked. Uh, and it may make sense for us to wait for that decision to see what happens. Uh, and then we, then the federal government is going to be in a much weaker position and is going to be much more willing to compromise with each state and give the states a lot more latitude than, than Governor Herbert has been able to get. Lisa. Is there any talk of nullifying Obamacare within the borders of Utah? There's, there's been, there's always talk about it. The, the problem is, um, and, and I've talked about nullification. I, I, I'm a strong proponent of that concept. I think states inherently have that right. But that's not what our federal courts have said. And our federal courts serve their federal master. And so we have been conditioned in this country to believe that when the federal courts speak, that's the end of the debate. And of course, that's a, that is a, a theory that grew out of a federal court case in 1803 Marbury versus Madison. It wasn't part of the Constitution, still isn't part of the Constitution, that the federal government's courts get to be the final word on disputes between the, the, the state constitutional power and federal, and federal authority. So, but we've lived with it for so long that you just cannot get traction with a nullification argument. No legislation even talking about it? I ran that bill the first session. I was there on uh, federal firearms regulation. Took all kinds of heat for it. Uh, and uh, no, we couldn't get it passed. And the governor said if it did pass, he would threaten it because we have to obey the law of the land. Our own governor defers to any federal act as the law of the land. And so that's just the reality we have to deal with. Now, maybe that changes gradually over time, but nullification arguments just don't get any traction in in today's political environment. So let's, uh, so let's move on then. I want to talk about the, the other big issue is fuel tax. Um, let me just state my belief, which I believe is probable, is, is well-founded, and, and is the probable outcome of this session. I don't think you will see a tax increase. I don't think you will see a sales tax increase. There's just not an appetite for it, and I'll explain why in a minute. And I don't think you're going to see an immediate gas tax increase. But we do have a structural defect in our gas tax that we do need to fix. And that is a fixed cent per gallon uh, gradually erodes away to nothing. Last time we increased it, in 1997, we went up five cents to 24 and a half cents. That 24 and a half cents in 1997 dollars is worth less than 16 cents in today's currency. And uh, meanwhile, through inflation, you know, you've got the cost of materials to maintain roads continuing to go up, our purchasing power continuing to go down. We can't survive. I mean, it's suicide, really, to, to continue on this path. I know a lot of people have said, well, let's just add 10 cents or 20 cents to the gas tax. That's a stopgap measure. We're right back in the same place 10 years from now. Uh, and, and so the, the structural flaw is you, you've got to fix the problem, and that requires having a tax rate that keeps up with inflation, just like our sales tax does. When you go every year, and buy clothes for your kids when they start school, the clothes may be a little bit more. But do you consider that a tax increase? Because the price of the, the good went up, the sales tax you pay on it is a little bit more. But do you turn to your government and say, thanks for increasing our taxes? Yeah. No, I don't think you do. <laughs> I mean, if you're rational, I don't think you do. Um, and, and so, that's the solution, and so I think what you'll see is a conversion from the cent per gallon to a fixed rate that uh, over time will keep our purchasing power the same. How would that work with 
fluctuation of the price of gas? Well, it would be based on the price of gas. So, so like if it's two dollars, let's say ten percent, so it's twenty cents. But if it drops down to dollar fifty, the government gets fifteen cents. Right. If it goes up to third three dollars, they get thirty cents. Right. So there would be volatility. That's the one that fix the problem because it would be so volatile. Yeah, well, it would be volatile, but if you look at if you look at the trend line, it's it's gradually going up. Inflation causes that. So not anymore. Not with the gas prices now. No, but not not if you take this a snapshot. A but if you if you look blip. over a number of years, yeah. it, it will go up. It, and uh, it, 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 really, it's it, it can't go down much more, can it? So it's 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 a good time to do that for for stability purposes because it's not if had we done this a year ago mm. the state would be really hurting right now i mean our gas tax revenue would be, would have been cut in half i like the idea that it's difficult for the legislature to raise tax but it's an automatic yeah i don't uh, I have a question. how do we fix our roads without having the right amount of money to fix them yeah exactly because, well you know there's i have been in the city of this state that has good roads yeah St. George is pretty good, right. for the most part. St. George, St. they George. do a pretty good job. Okay. Well, but they don't have the winters to deal with. Yeah, but they, yeah, they don't have the freezing problems. Yep. But I mean, we've got to have something to fix this thing because we're not paying taxes, but we are paying for tires and shops and- Right end alignments. Alignments and all the other stuff that has to go. Scratch front bumpers. So is that your, are these funds when they're collected earmarked for a certain the gas tax is earmarked for transportation. Okay. Now, here's the problem. Through influences, both in and out of the state, transportation, the definition of transportation has been expanded to mean things that we wouldn't have thought 40 years ago. Bike trails, walking paths, pedestrian paths, things like that, and transit. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, we have... Mayor Daniels is still here, and I know I'm not going to make a, a friend, <laughs> but I'm going to speak bluntly, and, and uh, it's probably not the, and, and, and my, my projection may be wrong, but I have a pretty good sense uh, that this is where the vast majority of other legislators are. The, the League of Cities is asking for another 20, uh, another two, excuse me, another 25% of a point uh, increase local option on sales tax, not gas tax, but sales tax. So your 6.85 would go up to 7.1, yeah, 7.1 uh, if it was implemented. Um, here's where the legislature, and again, the majority, the consensus, not everyone believes the same way, but the consensus of legislators is transportation is something that ought to be, for, for, uh, to the greatest extent possible, funded through a user tax. Those who use the roads should pay for them. And how do you do that? What better way is there than through fuel? Well, registration fees is another thing, but if we raise the registration fees, even if we cut the gas tax, if you were doubling your registration fee, you'd be, you'd be coming after me with pitchforks. So, uh, I don't want that. Uh, so, so that you know, that's kind of off the table. We're really not talking about registration fees, but user fees. And, and this is not just a Utah thing. This is the this is the standard nationwide. Is that transportation should be funded through user fees to the extent possible. Um, so, so there isn't much of an appetite for a local option. There. And, and it's not just that. It is, we've done this three times already. Can you put the next uh, one up there, the other PowerPoint? We have, at the county level right now, your legislature has approved three different times a quarter percent local option. One of them is, was subsequently increased to 0.3%. Uh, so right now, you've got uh, 0.8% percent local option for transportation. You working on that? And, and here's where we are with it today. The first one, the oldest one, is 100% of 
public transit. UTA controls that for the most part. The next one, oh, and, and by the way, that one was designated transit, so public transit. So, so the, your, your local governments have no control over that. If they're going to impose that, they, they have the option to, to put the quarter percent uh, raise in place, increase in place, but if they do, the, the funds have to be used for public transit. But the next one we had, which was the one that was originally 0.25, was increased, uh, it doesn't matter when it was, but it's, it's 0.3 now, could be used for public transportation, state and local highways. Local highway is defined as a, a road of regional significance. So um, that's what uh, North County Boulevard is. Um, it, it would probably also include, well, definitely State Highway Canyon Road. Um, the problem is that the county controls this, where, the, where this money is spent. And then the third one, we have a couple things more added. State highways, local highways, public transit. We have airport facility and traffic and pedestrian safety, and this is where you get bike and, and uh, pedestrian paths in. So what the proposal now is from the league, and the counties also, the, the, the Association of Counties is also asking for that extra quarter point, but there's conflict between the cities and the counties. The counties want to control it again, and the cities want to control it this time. And, and if, if you look at where we're spending the money today, you can certainly understand why the cities want to control it. Mayor, are you getting much of this money? And you're about to get less, if that's possible. <laughs> so this is where BRT comes in. Out of this green box here, out of that, that money, we built North County Boulevard, which we benefit from. But what, what BRT, the proposal in Provo and Orem right now, will take all of that money at the whole county level for the next 12 years and it'd be dedicated to BRT. So now there's some of that money that's already been collected and is earmarked for some projects that, that they've already identified. Those projects would continue, it wouldn't derail them, but no new projects would be approved out of that money for 12 years. Just a minute, I'll get to you. Just what's BRT? Yes. Oh, BRT. Bus Rapid uh, Transit. Bus Rapid Transit. This is a $150 million project <clears throat> that will service Provo and Orem. Well, it'll only come up to yeah. South Orem, to University Mall area and Parkway, and then down to kind of the uh, middle of Provo, Provo downtown. And it'll just be uh, Bus Rapid Transit. There'll be designated lanes in uh, in the roads just for those buses. That's $150 million. $75 million, though, comes from the federal government. So here we go again, making decisions to chase the federal dollar. Now you look at these local options, 0.8 of 1%, that's, a, that's hundreds of millions of dollars, by the way. Uh, virtually all of it, oh, you see at the bottom there, 92% of the, the orange column is going to transit 100% here, 100% there, if, if BRT passes. All of that to transit. Now, at some point, you know, back when we first started this, it made sense to try to stay ahead of the curve and, and get on uh, this public transit bandwagon. But we have been acknowledged by the uh, Federal Department of Transportation the Wasatch Front uh, UTA as the best, by far, the best public transit system for a metropolitan area of our size. We're the best, folks. Best in what? Best, best in for the a country. metropolitan area of our size, the Wasatch Front. UTA is, is far and away the best system. In coverage, in revenue, in... In, uh, in, yes. in, in, in service. Service to the community. So we're, we're having more transit to more areas? Is that what Yes, you're for a metropolitan area of our size. Okay. Now, New York and D.C. and San Francisco, they've got much more sophisticated systems, but they're ten times our size. Um, so, we're the best. Are, are our roads the best? Not even close. Not even close. So here's my frustration. To be asked to 
increase your tax, or to at least pass a law to increase your tax, or to, for, for the local jurisdictions to be able to increase your tax, doesn't sit right with me when we've got those three buckets already in place, and we're making a decision to take a third of it that could be used to service many of the roads in Pleasant Grove, many of the roads in American Ford, to maintain them and give it all for the next 12 years to transit to a system that is already recognized as the best for a metropolitan area of its size. Sure, it would be nice to have more, perhaps, for those who, like, who love transit. It would be great for certain property owners, uh, for certain cities, to have $150 million invested into Provo, for the most part, a little bit to Orem. That's great for those cities. But what does it do for District 57? Lisa. That's only just to build it. I mean, we're paying, we've done through the UTA audit, and we pay 80% for someone to ride anything, whether it's a bus, rail, commuter rail, anything. The citizens who are not riding can pay 80% every time someone gets on one of those things. And they only pay 20% yeah. for the ride. The fees, are so the, the, the fees are so low, they don't cover it. Uh, yeah. You know, even half of it. You're right. but. That argument to me that the, the taxpayers are subsidizing transit is a little bit hollow because we subsidize automobile transportation as well. We, we pay for all the roads and maintain them, so, uh, and some use them more than others and some don't use them at all. Uh, but when they go buy gas for their four-wheelers or their boats or their, uh, their lawnmowers, they're still contributing to that. So yeah, it's, um, there is a lot of subsidy that goes on it's, it's hard for me to genuinely single out transit as being um, something we should ax because we subsidize it well, when we subsidize everything. But, but we do subsidize it at a greater rate. I'll not really comparable well, subsidies, though. What? Not really comparable subsidies, though. Roads and mass transit. No, right. no, no I mean, there are differences, certainly. Well, huge, and huge differences. I mean, I mean, the other thing that we got to remember is that that while we do subsidize it at this point, part of it, when you when you think about planning ahead, you know, securing the rights of way for rail, for example, right now, I mean, that goes into the cost that we're paying for, and maybe we're running the train too soon. But at the same time, if you if you're going to pay to acquire the right of way that is going to serve you in a hundred years and would cost a zillion dollars to buy at that point, then nobody is going to, to say, okay, let's buy the right of way and never put a train on it. And those are long-term decisions that your, your city and county and state leaders have to make, and they're not easy decisions. My point in, in sharing this graphic with you is that's not the only factor. Our roads are failing. They're just miserable. I hope all of you hate driving on them as much as I do. Uh, as much as I love living here, uh, you know, every time I come down that hill and hit a big pothole, I say a curse word under my breath because I know I'm gonna, gonna have to go get my front end aligned again. And, you know, or you know, my tires. I mean, I get like 25,000 miles in a set of tires. And I'm sure all of you do as well, but uh, that's because of the condition of our roads. Our cities don't have enough revenue to adequately take care of them. A lot of that is due to the declining purchasing power of the gas tax revenue that they do get a share of. But this is a local option. And Mayor, if you want to fight this and, and go and try to change the allocation and make sure that uh, that third quarter is something that the cities can control better, I'll be right there with you. Uh, we'll change that statute uh, because I think uh, this is just reckless. Uh, in, in my estimate, I, I can't see spending all of those three revenue sources 100% on transit uh, when we have such dire and desperate needs in our cities. Yeah. So, uh, so, why uh, is our state legislature? Do not introduce a bill that would help 
I can introduce that bill, but it is a heavy lift. You have powerful influences, associations of counties. You have uh, your uh, uh, metropolitan planning organizations. Your, uh, you know, we have Mountain, uh, Mountain Land Association of Governments here who, are, who have their own agenda. And they have influence at the state. But and, we elected you, so. Right, but I'm one vote, <laughs> one of 38. It, it takes 38 to pass. But there's the a whole bunch of cities that are in the same boat that we are that all need help that way with our roads. There, there are many, but I'm just, I'm telling you right now that regardless of that, many of them will be influenced by other factors. That's why I'm saying right now tonight, Mayor, if you want to make a change here, I'll run that bill. We'll, we'll change the allocation of that, or, or at least try, because I think that is the most prudent direction to go, and not use that money for bus rapid transit that only services Provo and Orem, and $150 million going into Provo and Orem instead of spread out through the rest of the county. Uh, we can't do that right now because the county has total control over where that goes. Now, yes, go ahead. You run that. <laughs> I will. Yes. But we, need to, we need to remember, though, that we've got Orem and Provo who have a lot more clout than Pleasant Grove and Perez that are going to be pushing the county mm -hmm. past this because they benefit. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a bad But this is, this is a local decision. Um, but they're, they're more, more they have roads that need to be fixed, too, though. Sure. They're not going to be fighting for this. So Take why conflate road. mass transit and roads? always conflating the issue of mass transit and roads. I think it confuses the issue. We, we defund roads in favor of public transit. There, there are separate issues. Even if you build the best public transit system, you do not decrease the need for roads. A, a lot of, I mean, there are, for the most part, the legislature tries to honor this age-old concept, principle of local control. The government making decisions at the local level, for the most part, is better for the people. That's what was done here. Because it's part of the sales tax, the state had to create the ability to increase it, but then it gave that authority to the counties with some parameters. If you don't like the decisions that were made, those decisions of where, to, where and how to spend that money were made at the county level, not at the state level. So, what do we do? Become dictators? So and the county yeah. commissioners too? This, county commissioner. this is a county commissioner issue. Mayor. Yeah, just two points, Brian. Uh, I support the change in the uh, gas taxes because I think that the way that it's set up today is okay. And that will result in more revenue in the cities, yes. Because right now, uh, the money that is generated and that will be generated will still end up in the same hands and be controlled by the same levels. There, there is no opportunity at the local level, when I say local, I mean the 248, 250 municipalities, there's no authority to raise any tax to cover roads. And, and what we're specifically asking Utah cities and towns is for the state legislature to grant that authority to pass the counties, pass MAG, pass anything else, and put it right in the hands of the cities so that they can. Okay. I would rather do that with that third order that's already in place than to uh, increase taxes even more just to do that. I agree with you that it should be a local, even more local decision at the city level. You should have more control. We can do that with that person, with, with that bucket that's already in place. I wish we could. But you're saying that's secure that right away. You're saying that can't change because it's out of your control. Just, 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 just
There, are, there will be a, uh, a lot going on with transportation funding. There will be a number of bills introduced. Uh, there will be an opportunity to, to create an amendment to one of those bills uh, to, to try to address this. Uh, and maybe with the momentum of, of the main direction of the bill, something like this could, could get uh, but gasoline tax incorporated. Is a user tax, and I think that's where the money ought to come from. Yeah. The sales tax ought to be buying in some groceries. Yeah. I think it ought to come out of the gasoline tax because everyone pays for the gasoline tax. Even the people who come from outside our city buy gasoline. And it will. So if, if we convert it to a percentage, the rate that the revenue generated will gradually go up, with meaning more of it will come back to the cities, and it will keep pace with inflation. Uh, so, so that will address part of the problem. I wouldn't be suggesting this if this was a new tax, but this is this is a tax that's been in place for ten years or more, and so it, since it's already there, why not? Make sure that we here at the local level are are benefiting equally from it. The chief officer of transit has already gotten the hooks of this. Orrin, has been, I mean, the mayor of Orrin has been fighting for this. The uh, chamber of commerce, you found chamber of commerce has been fighting for this. Mm -hmm. And I know. so I that's see, why I said it's a heavy lift. Yeah. So I don't see that. I, so in, in uh, for saying something that is not going to be done, I think you ought to have a plan B, which is what can we do. To gasoline tax more controlled by the local entities to fix their own roads. Since I'm paying that tax, I'd like to see a chunk of it going back to the city to be able to fix our roads. Right now they're saying that they don't get the even if we don't change it, how much we get taxed. The control of the money should be changed. Who gets to spend that money should be changed. Well that control is it, when that money comes to the city it's completely within their control. The, what, what the mayor was saying is that he, he doesn't think the allocation of it is equitable. The state keeps right. seventy percent of it, thirty percent comes back. We to we can tell road. because the minute you drive off of a U dot road onto a city road, you know because of the sound your car's making. Right. Yeah. I, I agree, and that is an issue that we'll, we will we will address, and I will fight for a more uh, equitable distribution. Maybe it's thirty five percent. I mean thirty five percent. 65% would be a huge difference. I mean, that would make an impact. I don't know how much we can get, but if, you know, it, we all need to come together in the legislature to tackle this and, and to come up with a solution. And that's going to take some compromise. That's going to take some back and forth. And, you know, if, if I'm expected to get behind something that uh, I may not find perfect, maybe I can do so if, if we can get a, a better allocation of those funds. Yeah. I mean, the last thing we want to do here, because this is this is something that we need to solve, and we, we can't let the you know, perfect become the enemy of the good. Maybe we don't get it all done the, this time around, but we need to start making progress. And so you have my commitment that I will fight for a greater uh, proportion of that uh, gas tax revenue coming to the local jurisdiction. But there's maybe even something we can do here, uh, since that tax is already in place. Question back there. Right. there. There's a common misconception that public transit is going to take more cars off the road, making it so that there's less road maintenance. But that is, in fact, from a transportation engineering standpoint, the opposite of the truth. The truth is that cars have an ESL rating of 0 0.0008, which is essentially nothing. They're negligible in all engineering calculations. For passenger cars. We could build the roads once and cars are wrong for a hundred years and there's hardly any degradation or surface roughness difference. It's the buses, the trucks, the heavy equipment, that's all the stuff that degrades the roads. It's a weight calculation. Yeah. Buses are at 0 0.68, heavy trucks are right around one. So 0 0.008 for a passenger car versus 0 0.68 for a bus. We're building more buses, we're creating more road degradation, we're creating more issues. This is a negative exponential function. Meaning if we put all the money into the buses and nothing into the roads, the roads are going to be great faster, we're going to have bigger financial issues down the road before we turn those roads. I think I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I understand, no, I but, but I get the gist. Uh, 
Okay, well, we're beyond quitting time, and I don't want to get kicked out of here, but uh, uh, I'm willing to stay a few more minutes. Uh, this was all I had prepared. I want to you know, answer any questions that, uh, that you may have on, on issues we haven't discussed yet. Yes? So we heard you submit the fight, the fight for us for the road. Also, if you have what other bills you are sponsoring or sponsoring that will directly affect us in District Yeah, I, I don't know that there are any bills that are specific to District 57. There are bills that will benefit every citizen. And, and so, you know, we're, District 57 citizens are part of the, uh, yeah, the whole. Yeah, we have students represent us, so I was asking how, how your bills and your, what is your sponsoring and your sponsoring are impacting us in the future. Yeah, well, I think the bills are impacting us Well, let me go through a couple of them. Uh, I, I have a bill that will uh, allow, and make it easier for small businesses and startups to uh, generate startup capital uh, by creating an exemption to our current very rigid and costly securities laws. Uh, so for anyone, any small startup business wanting to generate less than $2 million in, in startup capital, we will have a, uh, if the bill passes, there will be a method, a convenient, easy, cost-effective method to do that. That will help small businesses here in District 57 and throughout the state. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's one example. Um, I've got a, uh, you know, the state uh, school board uh, election process bill again, uh, the one I ran last year, that uh, will affect, I mean, it'll, it'll affect us statewide, but it will give citizens of District 57 greater uh, uh, involvement in the election of their state school board member. Are you sure that's what the people of our district want? Part of the school board election? Not every citizen wants that. I, I understand that, but uh, I, my sense is the vast majority do want that. I do. Yeah, and those I talk to, it's, 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 it's very one-sided. That. And it's not the fact that they're partisan, and that's, that doesn't make any difference to me what party somebody is. That's not why I'm running the bill. The reason that I'm running the bill is because it takes advantage of a process that seems to work. The candidates must come to the citizens, the delegates, state their case, ask for the vote. You get to know who your candidate is beholden to, what their philosophies are, Things you have no involvement in right now. That's the process, the partisan election process is the process that we have that allows that. That's why I, I suggest we use it. If there is a better process, I'm, I'm happy to look at it. Uh, but to create a new process costs money. And I was trying not to have this change be a fiscal impact on the state. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I just suggest you give more input before you go ahead with that. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I would suggest you really look at input from the congressional district. Oh, I believe me, I have. Uh, and I understand that not everyone supports it. Uh, and, and I appreciate that and I respect that. But okay. that's an issue How that I. Can... This group? <laughs> oh, let's, let's take a straw poll right now. Who would like to see that change in the state school board election process? Okay, and, and who would not like to see that? So it's about two or three to one, uh, which is kind of standard to what I'm, I'm experiencing. So again, I, I've taken input from many, many citizens of the district. This isn't something that I came up with on my own. This was something that people came to me and asked me to do. Many of many of our district citizens. The thing is now is, you, you know, the person who's appointed to that position or elected to that position is, has political beliefs on one side or the other already. You just don't know what those are. And so the election process sort of ferrets that out. Mm -hmm. So you do find out what their stance is on things, or at least their opponents will say things about it. And so I see nothing wrong with what 
what you might call partisanship, because they're already going to have partisan beliefs when they go in there, even if they're not appointed yep. by a Democrat or Republican. They have those beliefs already. They have those alliances, and we saw that rear its head in a local state uh, school board election. Our district here for state school board, we saw that in local school board elections in Provo, if you were following in these last elections. It was very political. It didn't have the party designations behind them, but it was very, very political. Every bit as much as it had the had party designations. There were different philosophies, and the schools and the children were used to take those messages home to their, to their parents, yeah. which I, I find very distasteful. Um, and so those are some of the arguments I've heard against making it partisan, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that that happens uh, every bit as much currently in our current system. And, and so I don't think we add to that at all with a partisan uh, election. Yes? So in our own local school board election this year, there was, if not illegal, at least extremely immoral actions being taken. Is there anything that the state can do to oversee the school board who believe they're above everything else and even above the law this year? Well, the, the state, there, there is an entity at the state level, and it's your state school board. Um, and uh, under our constitution, our state constitution, your state school board is responsible for the management and control of our public school system. That's why I'm very hesitant to carry bills that change, or that, that insert the legislature in the place of the state school board by uh, changing programs and, and policies and curriculum and standards. And oh, I don't think the legislature should okay. stick their nose in standards or curriculum, but there's, I think there's got to be some overseer if everyone's in the same bed, there's got to be someone looking in saying, and, and that's why you see so much activity out of the legislature, because we do get these, uh, this is one of the issues that, uh, that we're approached with more than just about any other, and it's ongoing, it's every year, it's education concerns. That's and, our call. We voted them in. It's our job to vote them out if there's a problem. I don't think there's any legislature or any judicial, if they're doing criminal acts, that's, that's right. Get them out, get them get thrown in jail, whatever else. But as for their decisions they're making, that's our job as citizens to vote in the right people to make the right decisions in accordance to what we want. Thank you. I don't, you don't see them, though. You don't see them. You don't get to question them. You get, you, right, right. There's not as much visibility on the school board level as there is on the state. You can board meetings every other day. Well, what, yeah. Local yeah. board, yeah. yeah. And my proposal doesn't affect the local school boards. The, the, the bill would only be changed the state right. school board to to use that partisan <coughs> process. And, and I think the best argument for that is is that each of our state school board districts are twice as big as a senate district. And you know somebody can fly under the radar real easy in an area that big. Uh, and, and so use this program to make them come at least to the delegates, at least to, through the convention, your primary process that delegates and voters are involved in, instead of only seeing two names on a general election ballot, and you're absolutely right, Mark, nobody knows who they are. Yeah. Because they, they have campaigned to the governor and to the governor's selection committee, not to the voters, the people that they need to serve. So I think we need to leave. I, I think that's why our uh, friendly guest is standing back there. Uh, I appreciate all of you coming. I'm happy to meet with you anytime, one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Contact me through uh, voice or through email, or just call me. My contact information is all on my website. Quickly, yes. Um, I just wanted to question. I asked, what do you think are the biggest things for our district, not the states? Well, no, I don't think the prison is an issue that really has a major impact on our, our district. I think it's, uh, I think it's roads. Uh, I think, I, I think our roads are the number one issue.
matters that need to be addressed. And, and that's why I spend time on it. That's why I, I, I'm going to do what I can in this session to make sure that uh, we are better allocating money to our local communities to do that. I, I think once, you know, I think roads, improving the roads will have a lot of uh, indirect consequences. I think if we, if we, if we have better roads, uh, you know, we may see more development. And so that, that has its own benefits to the district. But if our transportation uh, system is so uh, degraded the way it is, uh, it, it makes it tough for development to occur. And, and it's not attractive when businesses are looking for a new home. They know they've got a lot of, uh, two, two things happen. They know they've got a lot of uh, employees they need to have commute. But the other thing is, they become the source of fixing everything. And those are development conditions that are put on new projects, new businesses when they want to come in and build. Well, the roads can't accommodate the traffic you're going to bring in, and so you've got to redo a lot of roadway. A lot of intersections, a lot of utilities. So uh, I think infrastructure is key. Uh, I think that's, that's probably one of the highest priorities of, of our municipal governments. And to the extent we can help them at the state level, I, I'm, I'm happy to do what I can. So, how, how many bills should be exactly related to the control? Well, related to, to funding, transportation funding. I think you'll no, probably... From you, sorry. Oh. Uh, where, where you will be involved in a sponsor, a co-sponsor? Well, at, at this stage of the game, it's um, it's too late to have a standalone bill. So my approach will be you know, amending one of the other trans one or more of the other transportation bills, whatever one looks like it may stand the best chance of uh, getting through working with. Johnny Anderson, the House uh, sponsor of our major transportation bill, he's the, the chair of the Transportation Committee, and uh, working with him to try to get those changes in that, uh, that comprehensive transportation bill. All right. Thank you again for coming. I appreciate uh, your attendance and your questions, and, and I'm serious when I say contact me anytime. <coughs> Brian, thanks for doing this tonight. You're welcome. Hey, Troy? Yes, sir. If you have a minute, uh, well, I'll, I'm going to try to get a hold of you in the next few days. I have okay. something I need to discuss with you. Yes, thanks.